Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Dan Rothschild. I'm the Associate Director of the Global Prosperity Initiative at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Uh, I, we're the host of this event today. I'd like to thank the New York University Center for Catastrophe Preparedness and Response and the offices of Senator Landrieu and Representative Kennedy uh, for working with us on this event. Uh, the Mercatus Center is located at George Mason University. We're an economic research organization focused on the economics of public policy issues. Uh, two years ago, we started a project looking at the recovery of the Gulf Coast after Hurricane Katrina to see what we can learn from the social scientific point of view about how communities respond to disasters and recover after disasters. Uh, and I'm pleased that uh, we're able to work with New York University uh, and Representative Kennedy's and Senator Landry's offices to uh, discuss some of our results today. What we're trying to do today is to help promote some discussion, some understanding about how we can look differently at homeland security and disaster response policies, particularly by looking not just at what Washington or what happens in the state capitals or what happens in city halls, but what happens on the grassroots and community levels before, during, and after a disaster, and what that can tell us about how federal, state, and local policy can help us better prepare for disasters, whether they're natural or man-made. If I could just mention one piece of housekeeping real quick. When you came in, there was a light blue piece of paper on your chair. Uh, we would appreciate it at Mercatus if you wouldn't mind filling that out and returning it to us after the event. That just helps us know if what we're doing is useful to you so that we stay on track and uh, provide a service that's useful. Also, the uh, video of this event will be available on our website afterwards. It's www.mercatus.org. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Congressman Kennedy and have him come up and give us some brief opening remarks. He's the sponsor of House Resolution 1891, the Ready, Willing, and Able Act, which puts into legislative language a lot of the things that we'll be talking about today as far as community and grassroots response to disasters. So Congressman Kennedy. Thank you very much, Dan Rothschild, and thank you for that introduction. And I want to express my gratitude to <laughs> Senator Mary Landrieu for co-sponsoring this uh, forum and this event today with me, and also for her leadership in the wake of uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, we have assembled uh, a distinguished panel today that will speak on the topics uh, too often ignored in our discourses on homeland security. Such topics include the potential dual benefits of homeland security projects, citizen engagement, redefining readiness to leverage the reservoir of knowledge that citizens possess, and government needs in order to develop effective disaster plans, and lowering obstacles that are inhibiting the recovery of places like New Orleans. My late uncle, President Kennedy, once said that the role of government is not to make men more comfortable, but to help make men stronger. Humanity is endowed by nature with resiliency or strength to withstand and overcome adversity. Our role in government is to avoid constructing barriers to the manifestation of that resiliency and providing the public with the opportunities to turn personal tragedies into personal triumphs. Regarding barriers, I'm speaking of the social obstacles such as discrimination, economic obstacles such as poverty, and political obstacles such as dominating top-down command control emergency management frameworks that fail to respond to Hurricane Katrina and will fail again in the future. When it comes to terrorism and disasters, the general public is not a liability, but our nation's most important asset, yet an ignored stakeholder. <coughs> we can no longer allow preparing for and responding to recovering from and mitigating against disasters to be monopolized just by government. The public needs to become an active partner in disaster planning efforts, and our panel today will remind us that citizens actively participating in homeland security, bringing to the table their common sense wisdom and reasonableness, is not just an idea, but a perspective we need to internalize. To best sum up today's proceedings, I quote 18th century essayist Thomas Carlyle, who said, quote, every man is my superior and that I may learn from him. And so I thank all of you again for what you're doing today. And Eric Kleinberg, thank you again for coming. Eric uh, was one of my original uh, tutors when I first ran for Congress. Um, for on health care issues when he was at Brown University and I was a candidate for Congress back in 1994. 
Uh, Roz Lasker, thank you for your uh, being here, and Emily Chamley Wright, thank you for all of your expertise. And for everybody, the attendance is outstanding, and I encourage everyone to follow this up and certainly uh, get your members uh, in your own um, offices to be involved with this issue. It's striking that what we spend most of our time doing up here in our Homeland Security budget is buying fire engines and um, vaccinations and uh, all kinds of equipment. And yet when the proverbial hits the fan, how in the world are we going to use any of that when, you know, we don't have people prepared with the frame of mind that, uh, that we need in order to mitigate the, the real weapon of terrorism, which is terror. Um, and uh, what is it that we need to deal with in order to deal with the psychological weapon, which is what this war is really waging? Uh, what are we going to do with dealing with that weapon? And that is a, the weapon that we haven't really armed ourselves against. But we can, and the American people certainly have, as well as uh, other uh, people from around the world, the people of Israel have certainly demonstrated themselves to be very resilient from in, in uh, effectively defending themselves against time and time again. And why isn't it that we can't learn from those uh, examples? Uh, I want to thank Mike Barnett from my office, um, and I want to just point him out in case anybody needs to have a contact uh, from my shop. Mike's the fellow in the back, very humble, uh, uh, understated and underspoken, but absolutely uh, the fellow that's been on top of this from the beginning in my shop, and uh, thank him for his efforts in making this whole day take place. And uh, I'd like to ask for all your help in uh, bringing this legislation to the fore so when we bring it in the, re in the reauthorization of the Homeland Security Bill next year, we can include it in that and hopefully require that a percentage of all of our Homeland Security block grant dollars that go back to the states require some essential criteria in the spending of those dollars. I mean, because quite frankly, why does $250,000 to air-conditioned garbage trucks have anything to do with Homeland Security? $100,000 to send sanitation workers to Dale Carnegie self-improvement classes have to do with uh, Homeland Security. Or uh, $7,000 to outfit local canine um, with bulletproof vests. Um, I don't know if that's the dogs uh, <laughs> or the <laughs> officers. I hope it's the officers. Um, anyway, uh, with that said, I want to uh, now uh, call up uh, somebody who I know uh, can speak very effectively on this issue, and, and that is Dr. Monica Shock Spana. Uh, she is a medical anthropologist, senior associate with the Center for Biosecurity of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, an assistant professor of infectious diseases and an investigator with the National Center for Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism, a university center of excellence sponsored by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Dr. Shashkspana has led research, education, and advocacy efforts to encourage greater consideration by authorities of the general public's capacity to confront biological attacks and large-scale epidemics constructively. She recently chaired working group on citizen engagement and health emergency planning and was a principal organizer for the 2006 U.S.-Canada Summit on Disease, Disaster, and Democracy. In 2003, she organized the National Summit Leadership During Bioterrorism, chaired the working group on bioterrorism response that issued consensus recommendations to mayors, governors, and top health officials nationwide. Dr. Shakspana helped establish the Biosecurity Center in 2003 after serving at Johns Hopkins University. She received her PhD in cultural anthropology from Johns Hopkins University in 1998. You can see that if there's ever someone who's a bona fide expert in this field, it is Dr. Shakspana. I'd like to ask her to come forward at this time. Please give her a warm round of applause. Thank you. Disasters, epidemics, and catastrophic acts of terrorism require the judgment, effort, and courage of many people 
and not simply those who serve in an official capacity. And I'd like to thank Congressman Kennedy for being an early, constant, and outspoken proponent of this emergency planning assumption, and also for his very generous uh, introductory remarks. The Congressman's introduction of the Ready, Willing, and Able Act and his co-sponsorship of this briefing along with Senator Landrieu indicates his leadership and follow-through on a comprehensive vision of Homeland Security. Now that kind of vision of Homeland Security attends to the shock of an extreme event and the emergency response, but still manages to see through the spectacular into ordinary things. These unsung matters, typically in disaster-related policy, include regular people's capacity for creative coping, routine investments in neighborhoods and critical infrastructure that foster resilience. And lastly, the right ratio of government, civil society, and private industry in generating solutions to potential calamity. And all of our speakers today are going to be touching on some aspect of these themes in more detail. But before turning to our distinguished panel, I do want to commend members of Congress and their staff, many of whom are represented in our audience today, for the foresight shown in the bipartisan-supported Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act, which was signed into law last December. This act <coughs> singled out risk communication and public preparedness as, quote, <coughs> essential public health security capabilities, close quotes. That act also made emergency preparedness awards to the state and local health agencies via their cooperative agreements with the Department of Health and Human Services contingent upon having an explicit mechanism, such as an advisory committee, to obtain public comment and input on preparedness and response plans and their application. Now, those very modest provisions may seem unremarkable in our open society. But the notion that the U.S. public plays an essential role in disaster and epidemic management and also has a rightful claim on the direction of health emergency policy is not yet the conventional wisdom. Now, because of this act, it has a greater chance of becoming the national standard. So thank you very much for this insightful piece of legislation. I also want to acknowledge the researchers, the policy analysts, and the advocates also in this room who made substantial contributions to the content of that act um, and the support that it had across the aisle. So thank you. If implemented well, the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act presents a very ripe opportunity to advance what some are calling a culture of preparedness. Now, when I was taking the train uh, down here from Baltimore, I thought, okay, that kind of phrase is subject to a lot of interpretations. So I want to be clear to share with you what I consider to be a true culture of preparedness. And what it looks like to me is a lot more Diane Lapsons. Does anybody here know Diane Lapsons? You, you got a Diane Lapson in your own community. You may even be a Diane Lapson yourself. She was the vice president of the Independence North Plaza Tenants Association, which is this monstrous high-rise apartment complex just blocks away from Ground Zero. So after the Twin Towers were attacked in 2001 and started to crumble into a heap, and people were streaming away um, in search of protection, Diane, because of her leadership skills and connections with her neighbors via the Neighborhood Association, uh, worked with other members to help direct people who were fleeing for their lives um, because many of the police officers had converged on the epicenter uh, of danger. They pulled together urgent needs teams that went around through all the apartments to check on the shut-ins and the frail seniors and to see if anybody needed anything. 
And then when the pharmacies and grocery stores couldn't serve the neighborhood because the workforce lived outside of Manhattan, those <coughs> members of the neighborhood association volunteered. Well, first they had to sort of make sure that the owners were willing to open up, let volunteers actually take money and handle the till. But, so my idea of a cultural preparedness is more Diane Lapson's in the world. Now to identify factors and ways to motivate this kind of cultural shift, which I should add is also, it's necessary among both decision makers and the broader US public. The Center for Biosecurity convened uh, the Working Group on Community Engagement and Health Emerging Planning, Health Emergency Planning, and I had the privilege of chairing that interdisciplinary panel, which released its peer-reviewed recommendations in April of this year. I would like to just thank the working group members who included people with very keen minds and distinguished backgrounds in policy practice and scholarship. Just so you know the kind of brain trust that, that was represented, these, the members included decision makers from local and national government, health officers who have managed high profile events, heads of community-based partnerships for public health and disaster mitigation, and subject matter experts in community development, risk communication, public health preparedness, disaster management, health disparities, and infectious diseases. Now I'd like to review very briefly the principal findings of the working group as a way of foreshadowing many of the discussion topics that we're going to be uh, tackling today. Um, and out front, you're, you're welcome to take a look um, if you're interested in the finer detail about the full report. But first, the working group con 